What's up, Crave? We're going to be switching some things up today. We're going to be playing our game first, going back to the old Crave style. And so as you guys know, we've been playing this um, dictionary game where we're finding weird words. And then me, Kevin, and Jacob are all coming up with our own definitions, and it's going to be mixed in with the real definition. Um, and then we're going to pick what we think the real definition is. And if someone picks our definition, we're going to get two points. And if we pick the real definition, we get one point. Last week, Kevin got a total of five points. Jacob got a total of four points. And if we were playing golf, I'd be winning because I have three points. All right? <laughs> that's, that's not what we're playing. <laughs> that's yeah, not that's what we're it. playing. <laughs> All right. So our first word today is arenaceous. Arenaceous. I like that you're having to hold this tree off. Oh, that's man. <laughs> we went for a nature aesthetic today. Yeah. And, uh, it's not working out for Jacob. All right, arenaceous. <laughs> being attacked by a tree no yes. <laughs> um a resembling a hedgehog erinaceous mm. no. the overreacting to a simple thing erinaceous mm. getting tasks done in an efficient manner Ooh, erinaceous like the proneness to have excessive gas Ooh. i'm pretty erinaceous myself <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, which, under which definition? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'll go first again, okay, go and then first we'll go yep, this yep, way, this way. We'll go All clockwise. Right. Um, clockwise yeah. okay. Man, I I think I'm going to go with A, resembling a hedgehog. I feel like that's so far out there that there's no way someone made that up. Actually, no, Kevin probably made that up. <laughs> I'm I going with that up. <laughs> Last Aaron, minute switch, C. I know a hedgehog named going Aaron. With so. C. <laughs> I'm going to go with C. Okay, he's going to see. Getting, getting test done in an efficient now. manner. Okay. Oh, man. Um, I am going to go – I'm going to go with B. I feel like hedgehog is just too silly. Yeah. Um, and uh, and maybe I'm just – you know, maybe I'm just thinking D was made by Kevin. I don't know why. <laughs> but I'm going to go – Are go you implying with... I have excessive gas, Jacob? <laughs> You're not wrong. But... No. <laughs> On the right. Instagram, we have some Bs. We have a C. We have a B. Man. A, uh, A seems crazy. It really does. But could crazy be correct? They start with the same letter. They, <laughs> I'm going to go with... We've got some C's. A D. Aaron Oliver. A Aaron Oliver, your name is Aaron. What, is she, what does she say? D. D? Yeah. Wow, that sounds gross. Mm. And since I came up with D, I'm going to go with... <laughs> I told you. Yeah, oh, I didn't yeah. Make that up. All right, I'm going to say C, efficient manner. What is the correct answer? Did Robbie? he test done in an efficient manner? The correct answer is A. Oh! oh, 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 oh. Yes, my C. God. Wait, oh. is it two points, two points? Yeah. Two points, two points. Oh, man. So That is great. I got two points for picking for, – for Jacob picking mine. Okay. The overreacting to a simple thing because Aaronacious isn't going full Karen. It's wow. just going Aaron. Wow. Sorry to anyone named Karen. <laughs> so, wait, wait. It was B? No, it's the real answer was C. Oh, the real or A. a. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So confusion. But gotcha. Jacob got four points for picking yours wow. with C. Jump in. So we both picked C, and Jacob got four points. My yeah. Score. Right, so Jacob seen it at eight. Rob, you picked up two to tie yeah, me at, at five. five. And okay. Kevin still at five. Okay. All right. Our next word, word is two. Zertz. Zertz. Spell it, Rob. Yeah, spell it for the people. X E R T Z. Zertz. 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 All right. All right. So A. A type of bolt used in robotic engineering. No. B, mint for your copy machine. C, a <laughs> unit of measuring used in tracking radiation levels. D, to gulp something down quickly or greedily. Greedily. Jacob, you got first shot. Shoot oh, your man. shot. Man. That mint in the copy machine sounds good, but desserts. Uh, don't think it's a don't think it's a bolt. I don't know why I'm talking about this, so you guys can guess the wrong ones, too. Uh, Let's see what people are saying. Yeah, we got a D. Here. We got a C. Aaron Oliver says C. She's pretty smart. She's an educator. I, mm. I'm, I'm going to go. D. Yeah, I, I think I'm feeling that, too. I'm going to go C. Uh, it, C. It, it sounds so, it sounds so right. Yeah. Okay, I have to pivot. I, I also think C sounds really good, but I have to pivot <laughs> off of Jacob to try to <laughs> – to try to be yeah, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with A. a? No, wait. 
was the last answer A? Yeah. She wouldn't have put both two A's in a row, would she? Maybe they're all A. Uh, <laughs> Sarah's tricky. We got some more C's and D's. I'm going to go A. A? A team. A? Robsy? Zerts sounds a lot like hertz. Like the <laughs> unit of measurement of like energy. Okay. Oh. <laughs> just, it yeah. Hurts. I thought you meant like the car rental. No. Place. Oh. Oh. No, I thought you meant no. just like it hurts. So, like uh, pain wise. Or Jalen hurts. I think I'm also going to go C. Okay. I think I'm also going to go C. I don't think Jacob's going to pick his own. If Kevin, you were going to pick C, you weren't going to pick your own. I didn't make that one up, so I'm going to pick C as well. All right, what is C? It's D. D. Wow. Who, ah. who is C? Your boy. <laughs> no! Oh, I did a little political. Uh, yeah, you did. Yeah, that's good. Oh. I pick up four points there. Now I'm at nine. And mine was A, oh, the so robotic engineering. Points, so now so he's at two. seven. So seven. to recap, nine, eight, eight seven. seven. All right, Basically here we exactly go. Exactly what Comes we down were at. to the most difficult to pronounce word. What, yes. what is it, Robsy? Um, bar. <laughs> Baroque, Baroque, Marish. Dude, did she say pronunciation of that one? I, I don't know. No. Yeah. Um, I just really Barba, want to try to pronounce Barba it. Barbagimus? Barba... Barigamarish. Bar... Has anybody heard of this word? Bori, Borigamus. Arenaceous. Arenaceous? Barbarigamus. Barbaragamus. Barbaragamus. Bar Bar All right. The B word. What? Yeah. Oh, that's bad. Probably should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> We're live. My bad. Bar uh. A harmless, microscopic bacteria that is most commonly found in the lining of the stomach. Very specific. Okay. To have a rigged saw-like edge. Ridged. Ridged. Ridged saw-like edge. Okay. The rumbling in your tummy. Mm. Carl, <laughs> the outermost part or the inside of the lane? The knee? Oh, the knee. Outermost part of the inside of the knee. The outermost part or, or the inside of the knee. Okay, I'm first guess here, and I'm going to tell you. I don't think the writing of D makes any sense, so I'm, gonna, I'm throwing that one out. <laughs> I, when, I heard, when I heard myself try to pronounce this, it reminded me of of bubble gut, like when you've yeah. had too much Long John Silver's. So I'm going C. Mm, 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 C. Mm. That's I'm locking it in. Final answer. The rumbling yeah. in your tummy. All right, Rob Z. C. Aaron D. Got an A. Bubble gut. B. More gubble gubble mus. Man, I mean, all of these have just been so ridiculous. Some and so is just like. <laughs> That's, 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 that's what it is. It's a low-tech. <laughs> that's what theory. it is. That's what I'm going with. Robsy, what say you? I think I'm also going to go with C. Okay. I think I'm also going to go with the rumbling in your tummy. I feel like that's that Sarah Mickey talking. Syndrome. Jacob? Man, you know, I got to go C because I know I wrote D. So <laughs> I got to go C. <laughs> if y'all didn't pick A or B. Whoa, so everyone's going C. The, the answer is? The answer is C. Yes. All right. All right. There so we go. It all stays. So, to recap, 10, 10, no, 10, 9. You only get one point for getting the correct word. Yeah. Yeah, but I thought you were ahead right now. No, I thought you were ahead. We'll have, to, yeah. we'll have to replay it. We're all within one point of each other. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go back and review. Well, that was great. I Thank you for really playing along with Dictionary. Well, and we'll have our finals next week. Nope. We have two more weeks of the series. Oh, right? we have two more weeks. That's right. All right. Good times. Now Jacob's going to come and lead us in worship. All right. It just fell out of nowhere, this guitar. This, <laughs> this. Um, all right, cool. So uh, this first song we're going to do is a newer one uh, by Chris Renzima. It's called Springtime. I really like it. And so uh, hopefully you guys like it too. And if you do, uh, check it out on Spotify and all that stuff. So. the resurrection that we've waited for you buried the night you came with the morning you're the king of heaven the praise is yours of 
longer the quiet, the louder the chorus. Oh, 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 oh. We were singing here a song. Cause death is dead and gone with the winner. We were singing new song that hallelujah is flow like a river. Coming back to life, reaching for the light. Your love is like springtime. You're the living water.
now is your fault. Still your love fuck for me. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the technology to stay connected. We thank you for the many works that you're doing in this time, God. And we thank you for this moment here and be with the words that Kevin has to say. And may you speak through him. It's in your name. Amen. Well, it's good to see you, so to speak. Um, just a few things to start away here. Uh, I want to start just by going over a couple of announcements. Um, I don't know if you saw this morning's service, big church, um, <clears throat> but Brookwood will be re- Brookwood will be returning to live in-person big church on Sunday, June seventh. That is only big church, okay? So we are not starting Crave back on June seventh. We are hoping that shortly after we start back with big church, we will. Have no setbacks, no issues, and we'll be able to come back for Crave uh, shortly thereafter. But I am very much looking forward to seeing you in person June 7th, right up there in that big building. Uh, so I hope that you'll be here. Um, we'll, we'll take 
cautionary steps, but miss you and I love you and I can't wait to see you in person. Uh, just to remind you, we are in a series called Straight Out of Context, and so we're in week two. Last week, Robsy broke down Philippians 4.13, probably the chief offender of verses that are taken out of context. And so uh, we're going to be continuing that series today and next week and the week following. That'll take us through the entire month of May. Now, I know what you're thinking. Next weekend is Memorial Day weekend. Ordinarily, we would not have Crave. We will have Crave, okay, because I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be here. That's true for the guys. And so we're, we're going to roll. Um, if you're on the road, if you're on vacation, cool. You can still tune in and join us. Uh, so we'll continue next week. Rob's will be back with another one of the big time ones. But uh, today, before we dive in, I, I just want to give you some advice um, as you're thinking through, okay, how am I supposed to study the Bible? How am I supposed to understand some of these, uh, some of these questions about these verses that we have? Uh, the first thing I would recommend to you, Crave, is, is get a study Bible of some kind. I've had this one for a long time. This is a life application study Bible. It's a little beat up. It's a little frayed. It's a little rough around the edges. But but if you open up a Bible like this, it's going to give you some things that you're not going to get just in like a normal skinny Bible you carry around. It'll, it'll give you a timeline. It'll give you some information about the book. It'll give you key points. And then as you read through, it'll give you notes down below the, the passages um, just to kind of give you some insight into some of what's being said. I find a book like this, a Bible like this, very helpful. So if you don't have something like that and you're interested, reach out and let me know. You can DM our Crave account. And we've got a lot of these. And I'd love to put one of these in your hand. I think they're great. Um, the other thing I want to talk to you about briefly is uh, Rob Z and I both, although many years apart, took a class at North Greenville called hermeneutics, which is a very fancy word that means biblical interpretation. So you have to learn how to read, study, and interpret the Bible. And, and one of the books that I have, and that's called Grasping God's Word, um, I looked back through it this week, and it's very clear. I took the first chapter pretty serious, but after that, not as much. Um, but there are, there are some good questions as you're thinking about context, as you're thinking about reading the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, I would even say. But are you there, Testament, there. Uh, these are just some questions as you're reading to apply. These are helpful. So the first question is this, what did this text mean to the biblical okay. audience? So when this was written, who was it written to and what did it mean to them? Super helpful question for you. It can you. help you not misunderstand or misapply a verse. Second question is this. What are the differences between the biblical audience and, and us or, or me? So as I think about something being written in the ancient Near East to a primarily Jewish audience, what's the difference between them then and me today? Super helpful question. The third is this. What is the theological principle in this text? So even if it was written to a specific people at a specific time, like the verse we're going to look at today Okay, well, what's the principle? What is timeless? What transcends just those people in just that time? I think that's helpful. And then lastly, how should the individual Christian today apply that principle in their life? So uh, helpful questions, I think, that can be really good for you. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at Second Chronicles 7.14. You may think I just misspoke and meant to say Corinthians, but no, there is a book in the Bible called Second Chronicles. So if you want to turn there now, it's in the Old Testament. Um, it's before Psalms, so take a left if you open to the middle and you find yourself there. Um, this is the narrative portion of the Old Testament. It's, it's the telling of stories, and so you'll find First and Second Samuel, you'll find a dead bug perhaps over here off screen, okay. you'll find First uh, and Second Kings, and you'll find First and Second Chronicles. So go ahead and turn to Second, uh, second Chronicles chapter 7. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of context as to where we are because that is helpful. So uh, this is uh, right at the beginning of the rule of King Solomon. King Solomon followed King David. Solomon was David's son. And so uh, this is uh, where we're going to step in as, as God is speaking to Solomon. Okay. So let's read just this one verse and then we'll unpack it and talk about it a little bit more. It says this, then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven forgive their sins, and heal their land, right? So if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I, God, will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Now, you may not have heard of Second Chronicles. It's probably not a book you spend a ton of time doing your quiet time in, but this verse you maybe have heard before. I, I think this is one of those patriotic verses 
that you tend to hear around like Memorial Day, which is next weekend, or more specifically around the 4th of July, uh, right? Because it sounds really, it talks about the healing of the land and that sounds great. But I, I have to burst your bubble a little bit and, and just tell you, this verse is not about America. Now, lest you think I'm some kind of anti-America, red, white, and blue hater, that's, that's not true. I'm thankful for America. I'm thankful for those who have sacrificed all throughout history for our country, that it can be what it is today. But this verse is not about America, okay? This verse is not written to Americans. It was written in the ancient Near East to Israel, God's chosen people, his country. The promised land was Israel, not America. And so what happens with this verse a lot of times is people will make this about America. If America will just bless God, then, then this is his land. And we're, you know, America is the, is the land of the free and the home of the brave. And you have to be very careful when you start to elevate nationalism and, and your patriotism and taking it to this place where you think that America has some kind of special relationship with God that other countries don't enjoy. America is a wonderful place, but this verse is not written about America. So you need to grasp that. Context is everything. This verse, this sentence, if you will, is spoken to Solomon, who is the king of Israel. He has just finished the complete, he's finished the temple. They've been building this temple, the palace, all these things. It's taken years and years. It's done. And he prays to God. And then God comes, if you read before this verse, God says, I heard your prayer. And then he comes and tells Solomon, listen, if the people will continue to obey me, then things are going to be good. But if you don't, I'm going to send pestilence. I'm going to send plagues. I'm going to send a lack of rain. Your crops will die. These are the things that will happen. And in, and in the midst of that, if then they will turn and they will uh, you know, come back, then I will do these things. I'll heal their land. I'll forgive their sins. I will hear from heaven, right? The context is very different. This takes place under the old covenant. Now, I know you're like, well, it sounds like we're doing a lot of Old Testament history. And we are a little bit because that's when this verse was written. So we have to understand old covenant versus new covenant. So under the old covenant, there is much more a sense of if you do this, people, then God will do this. It's kind of transactional. This, this passage here in Second Chronicles 7 really harkens back heavily to Deuteronomy 28. And you can go and check that out on your own time. It's towards the end of Moses's life. It's right before the people are about to enter the promised land. And Moses stands up on behalf of God. And in Deuteronomy 28, he's basically saying, you can choose life and blessing following God, or you can choose curses and your downfall by following your own path right? And he lays out, if you do this, God's going to do this. If you do this, God's going to do this. It's very transactional. And what I want you to understand is we do not live under the old covenant anymore. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't things we should and should not do. But what I am saying is that the people of Israel were governed differently. The old covenant, the law was what they had. We have the fulfillment of the law. Christ came and said, I didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. I've come that you would have true life, and that can only be found in me, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. And so Jesus has come, and he's established the new covenant of grace. And so we're not bound by the law. You have to understand, so the context is different, because I, here's what I think we do. I think that we begin to go, well, I have to do this, this, and this right so that God will bless me. But if I do this, this, and this wrong, well, then this is what God's going to do to me to punish me. And we can begin to think that it's kind of this cosmic scale that rises and falls with how good we do and, and maybe how bad we've done and these different things. But what you have to understand about the Bible is that's not what we see taught anymore, right? So first of all, you look at Job, even in the Old Testament, Job, who you know, lost everything right? And his friends show up and they're like, well, Job, you must have sinned because God wouldn't do this to you unless you sin. And Job's like, I didn't sin. They're like, well, Job, you had to have done something. He's like, no, no, no I didn't. And if you read in Job 1, uh, there are four things that are said of Job. It says that he is uh, a blameless person, right? Not saying he had never sinned, but he had right standing with God. He was blameless. He had complete integrity. He feared God and turned from evil. So Job had not done anything wrong to bring upon himself what happened. And his friends insisted that it had. But in the end, God shows up and he's like, no, Job was right. I, I did this, that my power would be displayed. And then you even go uh, into the New Testament in John chapter nine, the first couple of verses, the disciples and Jesus roll through and they meet this man who's born blind. And the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned? Was it this guy or was it his parents? Why was he born blind? And Jesus says, neither. This man was born blind that 
my power, that the glory of God might be displayed in his life. And so we have to understand that it's not always, well, this happened, so then now here's the retaliation. Because here's what we know. Good things happen to bad people, right? We always ask that question, why do bad things happen to good people? And, and we know that that happens. But why do good things happen to people who are evil? Why do these people seem to prosper and they seem to be blessed? Why do they continue to seem to be able to get ahead when we fall further and further behind? Because it's not this transactional thing. We live in grace in the new covenant. And there's common grace for everybody, regardless of whether they're following Christ or not. You can go study that concept of common grace. That's worth your time. So just be careful that when you look at a verse like 2 Chronicles 7, that you don't misunderstand the context, that you don't get to this place where you feel like I have to be able to check this list off in order for God to like me or to love me. All right? And it's not about America, okay? You're with me. Now, all that being said, there are some great things in this verse that I think are worth our time because we have to think about that question that I asked you towards the beginning from this book, right? Okay, so what's the principle? Meaning, it applied to them, but there's still some application for us today. And I would tell you, I think that any one of us who would claim to follow Christ today would benefit from humbling ourselves, praying, seeking his face, and turning from our wicked ways. So just, just to unpack that a little bit, humble yourself. Now, do you consider yourself a humble person? It's a trick question no. because if you're like, oh, I'm incredibly humble. Trick question. You see what you did there? But humility is something that we need to practice. Most of us operate as if we are the most important person in our life. We come with selfishness built right in, okay? You don't have to teach a baby. Trust me, I have one. You don't have to teach them how to be selfish. They want what they want when they want it, and they want it now. And there's some part of that that sticks with us beyond being a baby into our teenage years, into our 30s. We are a selfish pe people by nature. And so to be humble is to understand life's not all about you. And we want to humble ourselves under God and realize that he is sovereign. He is in charge. But we often just operate like we're in charge. Like, I'm going to make my decisions. Whatever happens, happens. That's not a healthy mentality to have. I would encourage you to check out Philippians chapter 2. It's a great passage on humility. I'll read just a few verses to you. Philippians 2, 3 through 5 says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Okay, well, Jesus was incredibly humble. Jesus was constantly giving of himself for the betterment and the blessing and the benefit of others. Are you? If you're like me, I've been home for 62 days, and it's easy to slip into selfishness. I just want to do what I want to do. I want to veg out with some Netflix. I want to do my thing. And maybe you face some of that, but I just want to challenge you. Look for ways you can be humble. Look for ways that you can maybe not think you're right, maybe not put yourself first, put somebody else first, and put God first ultimately in your heart. So that's the first thing that's in that verse, humble yourself. Then he says, if my people will pray, right? Prayer is a priority in our life, or at least it should be. Unfortunately, most of us, when something's going on, prayer's our last resort, right? Instead of going to God first, we'll go ask anybody else in our life, right? Maybe you'll ask your parents. And listen, that's great to have conversation with your parents. You'll ask your small group leader. That's great. You, you'll maybe come talk with me. You'll talk with friends. But have you stopped to talk to God? About it? Like, have you just asked God, hey, God, what am I supposed to do here? And then just listen. You see, when we pray, we talk a lot. And that's coming from me. I'm a talker, okay? I'm an extrovert who's been trapped at home for two months. So when I see you in person, I'm going to talk your ear off. It's going to happen. But the reality is our prayer lives look like that. And God, here's this, here's this, here's this. And we have to sometimes be willing to be quiet and just listen to what God might be saying to us. Prayer needs to be a priority. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, never stop praying. The reality is a lot of us never start right? And if we do start, it's like this token prayer right before our meal. God, thanks for this food. Please don't let me choke on it. Amen. Right? Or like before we go to bed at night, oh God, please don't let me die in my sleep tonight. I'm not ready to die. Amen. Like, okay, I mean, I'm not, I'm not completely tossing those prayers out as worthless, but I'm telling you, your prayer life needs to be a priority. That's what is being said in this verse, right? It says, seek my face. Now, what does that even mean, to seek God's face? Moses asked, could he see the face of God? And God was like, nah, all you can handle is seeing my backside as I go by. That's not necessarily what this verse is meaning. Seek my face. The Hebrew word for face really means presence. So to look for the presence of God in your life, what does that mean? 
How can you look for God's presence? Well, I would tell you, first of all, get into the Bible. Now, again, you maybe don't like reading, but we have God's word and that's how he's chosen to communicate with us. So if you can look back at this last week and just think about how much time have you spent being in your Bible? How much time have you spent studying what God has to say to you? And I say study because it's easy to just kind of read, 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 knock it off my list, right? Check it off. I want to open the Bible app so I can keep my street going, right? But when's the last time you took time to study? Because that's where you can seek and, and know God, right? When's the last time, again, prayer coming back up? You made prayer a priority. You've probably talked to a million people this week. How much have you talked to God, right? Christian fellowship. Now, this one's tricky because we're not gathering in person right now, but there are still means that, that you can connect with, right? Like we have stuff going on here on our social media throughout the week. You have the opportunity to FaceTime or Zoom or Skype or whatever with your people. And I'll just be honest with you. There's some fatigue at this point. Two months in, it's like, this was kind of fun at first, but now I just don't love doing this anymore. And so it's just easier to disengage. I felt that myself. It shows though. It shows in even some of our numbers with the interaction we're seeing. And I get it. But what I want to tell you is you have to fight for community. You have to fight to maintain those relationships with people who are going to point you towards Jesus. Cause that's part of seeking him is surrounding yourself with people who are going to point you towards him. So something to think about. Last thing it says, turn from your wicked ways. Now this one's not very hard to understand. There's no mystery here. Every single one of us has something in our life that is sinful, that is wrong, that is out of line with God's will that we are tempted to do. All of us. And it may look different for you than it does for me. And the hard part is we climb up on our high horse and we judge people because they struggle with something that we don't struggle with, right? Oh, you struggle with drugs? Well, I've never been tempted to do that, so you must be awful. Your temptation could look a lot different than mine. And it's not our place to, to judge each other. We want to help each other. But first, we need to make sure that we're looking inward, right? And dealing with our own temptations. We got to deal with that sin, with that habit, with that hang up, whatever that is in your life. Hebrews 12, 1 says that we should strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that trips us up. There are things in your life that are not sinful that can slow you down. But there are things in your life that are sin that need to go. And I don't know what it is in your life, but you do. You're painfully aware of it. Like, as I've been saying this, you know what it is and you know, it needs to go. It's a part of seeking God. It's a part of prioritizing him is cutting out that sin. That's what we need to do because he says, if my people who are called by my name now, yes, that's Israel. But in a sense, we are still the people of God, right? Christians, Christian means little Christ. So if we want to say we're the people of God, right? Then these are four steps we should take. We should humble ourselves. We should pray. We should seek his face and we should turn from evil. Now, the back half of this verse talks about what God will do in that situation. And again, I don't want you to get this necessarily this transactional thing going, but do understand, I think there's still some truth here for us. I do think God hears our prayers and it may not feel that way to you. Maybe you feel like I've been asking and asking and asking and God just won't answer my prayer. Maybe the answer is no, or maybe the answer is wait. But I do believe that God hears us when we pray. I do believe God offers the forgiveness of sins. Listen, that's what the coming of Christ is all about. Jesus didn't come because he just wanted to hang out on earth. Jesus came to live a perfect sinless life, to die on the cross and rise from the dead. And when he did that, he conquered sin. He conquered the grave. He established eternal everlasting life for us, for his people. So I would just ask you to think about, are you seeking that? Is that important to you? Are you looking for that forgiveness from God? Because most of us, we just act like, oh, what I did is not that big of a deal. I'm certainly not. You know, worse than, I'm looking at Jacob. Oh, Jacob's way worse than me. I don't need to ask forgiveness for that. No, no, no. All of us need forgiveness. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So if we can humble ourselves to the point of grasping that, I believe God will forgive us. And, and that's true. And I do believe God can bring healing in our land. Now, again, it's not necessarily saying that God's going to do something crazy and, 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 because Israel's not America. America's not Israel. But I do think God can bring healing. I think he can bring renewal. I think he can do something special in your life. And when God does something special in your life, it overflows in the lives of those around you. And at that point, you begin to see some healing take place, maybe in some relationships, maybe in some brokenness or some bitterness. So uh, I hope this verse has been helpful for you. I challenge you, go and read more uh, around this. 
to understand it and do that anytime, especially hey, anytime someone's going to teach from just one verse, you should read the surrounding verses, right? Read the surrounding chapters, maybe read the whole book, right? Check it out for yourself. Do some research. Okay. Don't just believe anything that anybody tells you go and do the work yourself so that you can understand the proper context, understand what's going on. Uh, I love you. I want to pray for you. Um, and then if I think of any announcements I need to make, uh, I'll make them. But let me pray first. God, thank you for our students. I thank you for the Crave crew, wherever they are in their homes or in their backyards or in a parking lot somewhere. I just pray, God, that you would bless them. Uh, I pray that you would help them to know that you love them. God, in the middle of everything we've been living through, it can feel like sometimes, God, we're just kind of off on our own and maybe... Maybe you've forgotten about us, but we know that you hear us when we pray, God. You are near to those who are brokenhearted, God, that if we seek you, God, we will, you will make yourself found by us. And so my prayer is that each of us would seek you, God, that we would look for you, for your presence, for how you're moving and stirring in our lives. God, I pray as we study your word, God, that we wouldn't get confused and make it about us, God, that we wouldn't read ourselves into your word, but God, that we would understand what you have to say to us. And so I pray that uh, you give us wisdom and discernment. God, I pray that your word would transform us, make us more and more like your son, Jesus. And, uh, we love you. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. And God, in conclusion, we just, we ask that you would bring healing uh, with everything we're seeing from the coronavirus. God, we pray that those who've been most impacted would be comforted. Uh, we pray, God, that soon we will be able to gather again in person safely and we look forward to that time so we make this prayer in the name of your son jesus amen all right it is really hot even in the shade even with the sun behind a cloud uh, so we're going to get out of here um, again don't know that i have a ton of announcements uh, we will be starting a new uh, journey through a book this week we're going to tackle the book of james and so on tuesday I'm going to touch on James chapter one on Thursday. Rob's he's going to come back and hit James chapter three on Saturday. I'll tackle James five. That's only three of those chapters. What happened to chapter two and four? Well, we're going to ask you to read two and four on your own and study it. So Rob's and I'll break down one, three and five. We're going to ask you to break down two and four and share some of your insight with us. Um, we miss you very much. Again, big church is opening June 7th. We're looking forward to seeing you up at big church on that day. Uh, but uh, I will communicate as soon as I can when I know what we're going to be back for Crave. Oh, geez. I can't think of any other announcements. I love you. I miss you. And we will talk to you soon. Bye.